Did anyone ever tell you that there are 12 historical facts that verify Jesus literally rose from the dead? And did you know that these 12 historical facts are accepted as true by over 90% of the most influential New Testament historical scholars in the world today? Well, it's true. So my question to you is, would you be interested in hearing what these 12 historical facts are? My guest today is Dr. Gary Habermas, one of the world's most respected and well-known scholars on the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Professor Habermas holds a Doctor of Philosophy degree from Michigan State University in History and Philosophy of Religion. And he is the chairman of the Department of Philosophy at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. He's also the author, co-author, or editor of over 40 books. So we invite you to join us for the special edition of The John Ankerberg Show to hear these 12 historical facts that show Jesus literally rose from the dead. Welcome to our program. I'm John Ankerberg, and my guest is Dr. Gary Habermas. Our program is for those of you today that are skeptics. You don't like religion. You don't like God. You don't say Jesus is God. You don't go to church and you don't want to have anything to do with it. You don't believe in miracles, any of that, all right? Would it make a difference to you if we presented to you 12 historical facts about Jesus' resurrection that are accepted by almost 95% of the greatest scholars around the world? If you go to the top universities like Cambridge or Princeton or, or Duke or any of these places, will agree with the facts that we're giving, okay? That's why I want you to listen and uh, I don't want you just to listen. I want you to think, well, what are you going to do with these facts? Okay? We've been talking about facts the whole time. But uh, Gary, in talking on certain campuses to university professors or just straight college kids that are really brilliant, the fact has come up with what he calls a shorter version of the 12 historical facts about Jesus' resurrection. He calls it the 6 plus 1. Okay, and I'm going to let him give us the list. And uh, we've left out a couple of things as we've gone along, but uh, just name the first one. It starts off with Jesus died by crucifixion and roll on. Sure. Uh, just a word about where these started. Back, yeah. we, we began these uh, five programs with um, the dissertation. Yeah. And my, my director, who was a skeptic, said, uh, you can use New Testament verses, but use the ones that are well attested. Don't just cite something that's true because there's a verse there. Yeah, you, which, you got your PhD at Michigan State too. Yeah, and, and, and so I, being a skeptic myself, I actually wanted more than that. I wanted more than just citing those verses which each independently can be verified for several reasons. So I started working on this, this idea that I later called the minimal facts. And the minimal facts I had been working on them for a few years before Michigan State, and what I was doing was, if all I knew were these things, because in the back of my mind, they're the best attested, can I pull it off with just this? And that's how it started. And the definition of the minimal facts, these six, is that I will use no fact which, upon stating it, it's not verified by a number of other background pieces of data. So everyone is multiply, not multiply attested, that's a rule of sources, but multiply evidenced with data. It could be an archaeological find, it could be not just a you know writing. But secondly, if the majority, the vast majority, 90-ish percent of scholars don't agree, I don't count it. And that's the reason for the plus one that we're talking about here. So those six which I would say are the, the key, would be Jesus died by crucifixion, the disciples had experiences that they believed were appearances of the risen Jesus. This was proclaimed immediately, and this, is, this fact is the one that's really buckled down since I did my dissertation way back in 1976, because critics are saying the consensus New Testament view is that this was proclaimed with them plus three three years after the cross. And some say that early creed, 1 Corinthians 15, was taken all the way back to the year of the crucifixion. People like James D.G. Dunn and people like that. Then they were willing, they turned the world upside down, willing to put themselves in hot spots for this message. 
Those are four. Then we have the two individuals, James and, and uh, Paul. And we name them differently, not just to get more facts, but because they're so different. James is the insider. Why me? You love him more than me. I mean, I can just admit, why don't you go tell him to make your bed? Yeah, James you know. was Jesus' brother. James is James, the brother of Jesus, because James, the son of Zebedee, is already dead. Yeah. Um, he's killed by Herod, and that's recorded early in the book of Acts. Uh, and so we have James and Paul, Paul being the PhD in Old Testament, as we've been calling him, an insider and outsider who say that these things are true. But then when Paul goes to Jerusalem and backs this up with Peter and James, the brother of Jesus, and later with John, uh, we're getting confirmation from the others so that 1 Corinthians 15, 11, we're all preaching the same message is also true. So that's a rundown of the six. And then I say the empty tomb. The empty tomb has about as much evidence as any of the others. You know, why don't you include it as part of your minimal facts? Because it doesn't have that unanimity of scholarship. And that doesn't make it true, but I like to have common ground when I start speaking. But evidence-wise, Empty Tomb belongs up there with these others. And it's been coming up since uh, we started doing this 40 years ago. It has. It, though the percentages have come up. Yeah, they've come way up since I was in school. Because, again, you, you hit it on the, on the head. When the Gospels are called Greco-Roman bios, the, the word for biography, then once you say it's biography, you have to look at the rules for biography, and now that's where they get a lot of these reasons that weren't available when I did my dissertation. They were just starting to come in. But things like multiple attestation, embarrassing testimony, enemy attestation, things like that, and there's a rule of a number of these. You have to kind of go slow with them. You can't just rush in and say everything that says this or that's true. But yeah, that's how historians balance data. Yeah, in other words, the way the historians were looking at secular history, right. all of a sudden was pulled over to the New Testament, right. and they started examining the New Testament documents the same way, and things started to pop, okay? Right. All right. Right, and I mean, you know what we haven't said hardly anything about is we're doing Paul the darling, and then Paul's trip to Jerusalem with the other big three, Peter, James, the brother of Jesus, and John, and they all agree, and they're all preaching the same message, and they lay hands on him. But you have a guy like James D.G. Dunn, who's as influential as anybody today. He's a British uh, New Testament scholar who retired from the University of Durham a few years ago and has written these massive historical Jesus books. He thinks he's got reason to find out that when Jesus was preaching, the Gospels cover most of this. He thinks there's good reason to believe there was note-taking going on, and we have sources behind the Gospels. So if you have sources behind the Gospels, and Paul's checking things out, and, and here's another little deal. The four Gospels, critics, a majority of critics, think that each of these four Gospels have at least one major source behind each one of them. So they're all doing this research. Matthew, according to the predominant views, Matthew uses Mark. Luke uses Mark. There's another source called Q. Now that bothers a lot of Christians, but we're not trying to answer the question of is there a document called Q? We don't have a Q document. But all you have to do is say this. There are verses that are in Matthew and Luke that are not in Mark. Where did Matthew and Luke get them when Mark's not in the picture? Now critics are saying the Jesus Seminar is saying that behind John, there was a miracles document because when Jesus... Uh, produces the water to wine, it says this is now his first miracle. Later it says this is the second miracle. And they think John is reading off a list of already existing, an independent list of miracles. And by the way, this is an aside, but critics say this, not people about the critics. The critics say that it's unanimous that Jesus was a healer and exorcist. Yeah, that's so, all, over, all over the place. So this is all together. You put this all together, and I'll just throw one more in here. Uh, Mike Lacona thinks this should be brought into the minimal facts, too. Jesus predicted his resurrection ahead of time. I mean, if something just happens to you, and it's incredible, like, wow, they were just about ready to tackle you, and you just threw it up, and it became a touchdown in the big game. That's kind of a just happens thing. But Jesus said ahead of time, it's orderly. Over and God, over again. God's involved over and over. That means, here's the key, 
That means he was a player. That means he was part of the saga. That means before it happens, he knew it was coming. That means he was part of the game plan. So in football terms, he was both a coach and a player. He's with his father making... There's too many things coming in here that point, and what do they all point to? All. Son of God, died for your sins, raised from the dead, what we call the gospel. Now that's God's side of things. That's God's side of the gospel. He defined what it is. Our part is the, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. Now I want to go back and I want you to tell your illustration about James because we haven't really discussed it the way you can discuss it, which I love. In the, the sense uh, of talking about Jesus appearing to James. Yeah, I think there's something really incredible. If you think of those four names that were there in, in Galatians 1 and 2, Paul, Peter, James, the brother of Jesus, and John. John is commonly believed to be the disciple whom Jesus loved. John is the guy that never did anything wrong. But the other three, this is a pastoral point, the other three, they all have issues. Peter, denies his Lord three times. And he's only the most influential uh, apostle. Yeah, supposed James, to be head of the, the apostles. Brother, the brother of Jesus, doesn't believe. They wish he would leave town. They think he's mentally disturbed in Mark chapter 3. That's not too much on the Greek there. That's what the Greek indicates. Yeah, that's what uh, James thought about Jesus. That what James thought about Jesus, and again, the Gospel of John says right. that. Paul is the skeptic who drags men, women, and children out. These three have issues. And so that's a little aside, how God uses wounded people to change their lives around. Because three of the four were wounded. But again, I go back to James, and I picture Jesus coming to him in, in a quiet of a, of a home and saying, it's me. Take a look. And it's healed. Go ahead and touch me. And I, and I referred to that little tiny story in the Gospel to the Hebrews just about 25 or 30 years after the Gospel of John, it's still very early, and it tells the story of James breaking bread with his brother. How special is that? Yeah, I know you think I was a goody two-shoes and my bed was always made and I never got time out and I know, listen bro, this, this is way beyond that. This is the story of the universe. This is the story of redemption. This is what I've been saying to my disciples for years, I'm going to die and rise. I've been predicting the saga we call the gospel. It's right here. And I think that, that was just too much. I mean, Paul on the way to Damascus with the soldiers, and they didn't hear all the words, eh, but they knew something was going on, and horses are probably scared, you know, everything else. But with James, it's probably the quiet over a little meal, like the family had together many times. And Jesus shows himself, and James turned the world upside down. If we didn't have a Paul and a Peter and John, James would have turned, all those guys turned the world upside down. Yeah, and I want for the folks that are saying, I want to know the sequence of where these guys met. Paul gets saved at two years after the resurrection. Goes into Arabia, and the fact is he spends three years there, all right? Then he decides to go to Jerusalem to check out to do this historio, he comes to Peter, he says, guys, I'm no example, you know, I was killing Christians when you guys were Christians, all right? So, you know, I have no really right to be here, but I got to ask you a couple questions, okay? Number one, Peter, you were supposed to be the head of the disciples, and the fact is, is that, uh, hey, you deserted him right at the time when he needed you, okay? And then when he saw you, when you saw him personally, what was that like? What happened? What did he say? Paul wanted to know that. Then he turned to James and he says, hey, you were the, you were the brother all of his life. You were watching the Messiah, okay? And you didn't believe. What did you experience when you saw him? And then they could turn it around and say to Paul, yeah, you were killing Christians. We remember that one. And that's why Paul says, I don't even deserve to be included in this group. Yeah, so he meets with Peter and James and then, a little while later, there's another gathering that we're told about. Talk about that one. Yeah, the second one is 14 years later, and that is usually dated between 47 and 49 A.D., which is interesting because if 1 Thessalonians is written in 50, these events are all before the very first New Testament book is written. And Paul, once again, it wasn't enough to do it at plus five, which, by the way, we get from 
two years for the conversion. He says three years later he went up there, and of course we accept Paul's word, so two plus three is five. And for those who think his conversion is late at three, three plus three is six. So that first meeting was five to six years. The second one's 14 years, all before 50. They're all on board. They're all preaching the same message. They added nothing to me, and they give Barnabas and I the right hand of fellowship. I often tell people when I'm in churches, I'll say, have you folks in this church ever laid hands on heretics? I'm just wondering what you do. I mean, who do you lay hands on? You lay hands on deacons, elders, pastors, missionaries, people that you agree with that you want to take the word out. That is symbolic that what happened when that meeting broke up halfway through Galatians 2, this group is going out gung-ho, all preaching the same message, and the, and the gospel of the deity, death, resurrection of Jesus was proclaimed by all of them. And the fact that Peter and James took it to the Jews and Paul to the, and Barnabas to the Gentiles, the group changed, but the message stayed the same. Yeah. Now I want to get to the folks that are listening, okay? The fact is what that last meeting talks about is that they were all preaching one message. And Paul says it was that Jesus died for our sins, he was buried, he rose again, he appeared to this whole group of people, okay? And the fact is they all vouched for that. And they said, that's it. And then the fact is you've got a great illustration for folks to understand how important it was, I call it the Kroger illustration, okay? okay? Right. Explain how that fits yeah. with the it, resurrection story. It's very practical. I, I picture, I go back to my skeptical days, and I would say, all right, all right, all right. So you got some facts here. And maybe your facts are better than secular history, Alexander and company. Maybe they're better than some of the world religions that their sources are much later. You're closer and you got checks and balances. This is great. Come on, are you telling me that if you were at your best friend's funeral and three days later, you're going through the steps, you're forlorn, you feel badly, you're gonna miss this guy, and you stop into the food store to get a loaf of bread. Are you telling me that if you saw your best friend that you watched that casket go down in the ground, you're just gonna go up and say, oh, Bill, good to see you again. And it seems too easy. It seems like something else is going on here. Well, here's the way I kind of developed that story a little bit. What if you're walking down the aisle of the grocery store and you see Bill and you go, Bill, do you have a twin brother or something? We put you in the ground the other day, man. This is incredible. Look at me. Look at me. Wow, you still have that little scar on your cheek and... And you're thinking about this and you pat him on the back. You got to feel it, right, 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 right. Let me, let me get that handshake. You got to get this. And you walk away thinking, but you go a couple rows over and now one other friend or two of yours are there and they see Bill. Now you're getting more evidence that Bill's standing there. And to make things more intriguing, you see one of the workers at the grocery store come down and mopping. Well, that's because somebody, somebody here has mud on their feet. And you look, and it's Bill, the one we buried. You go, what's that got to do with this story? Well, I mean, it's only a story. If the Shroud of Turin is a burial garment of Jesus, the man buried in the Shroud has dirt on his feet. This thing hasn't been out of Western Europe uh, in, you know, centuries. But that dirt was chemically analyzed, and it's dirt from the Jerusalem. It's limestone, and a peer-reviewed secular chemical journal is dirt from Jerusalem. Oh, no. Man, clean your shoes off before you come in here. But after a while, you're all patting each other in the back, and you're shaking hands, and you might think, I know it's super incredible, but incredible things happen in this world. And I'm telling you, it looks like Bill. But you don't see Bill again, let's say. But your friends may remember the day that you went in there for a loaf of bread. And I'm saying, the only point I'm trying to make is practical things could happen. The bread, the walking, the touching, the shaking hands, the mud on the feet. You could be convinced, you know, this might, this might go on one of those paranormal things on TV, but I can't explain it. But I saw him go down to the ground, and I saw him in Kroger. 
And the more it sinks in, now, if you can imagine, Bill is a guy who claimed to be the son of God, so there's a religious message. It's just card-playing Bill, who we've all been together on Friday nights. But now, if this is the guy who claimed to be the son of God, there's a message that goes with it, and you go, oh, my goodness. What if what he said was true? Now, you're doing this later after he's gone. What if that's true? And could God have ordained him to be... And that's the story. I think that's kind of how it came to the disciples. They were unpacking it in those first few days. Yeah, and then Jesus put these little, uh, little statements with it. He said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Or Paul said, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, okay? So the fact is that it's not enough just to know facts. There's, there's a little, you got to make a commitment here somewhere the along way, the line. Romans 10, 9 that you just quoted is one of the creeds. Even Rudolf Bultmann says it's an early creed. And, and Lord can mean anything. Lord can mean sir. Right. But Paul explains what that creed means. And right after he cites it, he quotes the Old Testament. And the verse he quotes from the Old Testament, it's Jehovah. Whoever calls in the name of the Lord, Jehovah, will be saved. So Paul goes, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, what do I mean by Lord? Well, Joel talks about it too. Yeah, only calls him Jehovah. Yeah, the oh one my that threw gosh, the world into space, right. Yeah, I mean, so now you're back to Kroger and you're wondering who in the world Bill is, you know? it's Well, he told us some incredible things about himself, but we all thought he was joking. Remember the disciples thought Jesus was, oh no, I'll protect you, I'll go to my death. They weren't getting it. And uh, it takes a while, a, pe a little while to uh, unpack this stuff. But the resurrection was what coalesced the story and shot it out of the cannon. That was what got them propelled. That's what spread across the whole Roman Empire within 300 years. That's right. Okay, and the resurrection was the key. And that's what the secular scholars are affirming <laughs> all the way around the world that you're documenting in your almost 5,000 page book. And all the facts are coming in like this. Right. Folks, I want you to think about the fact that Jesus actually appeared on this earth and he did certain things and at the end of his life he was crucified, rose from the dead, appeared to his disciples and he said go into all the world and preach the gospel. And the gospel is this, he is the Son of God, he did die for your sins, everything that you've done, every shameful thing, every guilty thing, every wrong thing, he's willing to take that on himself because when he died on the cross, he paid for that sin. It was put on him and he says, if you'll come to me and admit that you're a sinner and invite me to come into your life, the fact is I will come in. It's like going to a girl and saying, I do. I'm committing myself to you. You got to give yourself to the Lord. Have you ever done that? If you haven't, I would hope that you would do it right now. Stay tuned, I got a personal word for you. Stay tuned for a special word from John. Thank you for joining me to hear our program today. If you would like to learn the 12 historical facts that show Jesus literally rose from the dead, we are making available the five television programs in this series on DVD for a gift of $49. You will hear the medical and historical evidence that has led 99% of all historical scholars to believe that there is no more certain fact in history than that Jesus died on the cross. Then you will hear why scholars have come to believe that after Jesus was crucified and buried, he appeared to his 12 apostles, then to 500 people at one time, then to a group of 100 of his followers, then to a group of women, and also to individuals like Peter, his unbelieving brother James, and to Paul, who was killing Christians, the latter two men who were both converted when they saw the risen Jesus. Why is it that over 90% of the most influential historical New Testament scholars in the world at some of our most prestigious universities accept these historical facts as true. What is the evidence that underlies these 12 historical facts? The five television programs in this series will 
lay out the historical evidence for you. And you may order our five television programs in this series now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. Then we are making available a second series with Dr. Habermas called Evidence for the Historical Jesus. The six programs in this second series answer additional questions such as, how can we know what message was preached about Jesus before any of the New Testament books were written? Are there any non-Christian sources that tell us Jesus actually lived, died on a cross, was buried, and afterwards was seen by his disciples? What historical material inside and outside of the New Testament shows Jesus himself claimed that he was God. Our second series is also available for a gift of $49. And finally, if you would like to have both television series, all 11 TV programs, they are available together for a gift of only $98. And you may order these two series now by calling us at one 800 805-3030. Write it down. That's 1-800-805-3030. And you may call that same number any day this week, 24 hours a day. Further, you may also order this series and give your gift at our website at jashow.org where we have a secure place for you to give your gift. Our website again is jashow.org. And then, those of you who live in Canada may call us at 1-866-746-5803. And our Canadian website is jashow.ca. Next week on The John Ankerberg Show. This is the most important topic that anyone could ever consider. Because when you stop to think of it, time is short and eternity is very long. It's endless. And the moment that you die, you will either be in a place where you will see nothing but beauty and holiness and be welcomed, or you will be in a place of darkness and abandonment. 